So we do have our, our chief in the house, uh, Dr. Karpinski. Uh, so with that, uh, uh, let's let's start. Um, uh, we know it's going to be a little bit of a thinner crowd because we have our renal block also going on right now, and it's the Easter weekend coming up. But uh, we will still be recording this talk, and it will be available for those uh, who would miss it. Uh, so I have the pleasure of uh, of uh, introducing Dr. Samira Bell. Uh, Dr. Bell is a senior clinical lecturer at the University of Dundee and a consultant nephrologist as well. Uh, she's done her training in uh, her medical training in uh, uni the University of Glasgow, uh, and she's actually the um, uh, appointed at the uh, School of Population Health and Genomics uh, at the University of Dundee. Uh, most importantly, she's also the chair of the Scottish Renal Registry. Uh, and, and apart from, you know, our registries have mostly done ESRD work, uh, but one of the things the I've seen from the Scottish Renal Registry is the, uh, they have a AKI registry and, and, and Samira has done a lot of great work on that. Uh, so uh, welcome Samira and she's going to talk about utilizing big data to improve understanding and management of uh, AKI. Thank you. Thank you very much for the invitation. I'm delighted to, um, to be speaking to you today. So um, I'm going to um, start with um, talking a bit about the definitions for acute kidney injury, acute kidney disease and, and CKD and how really these um, definitions have allowed us to um, examine epidemiology and hopefully impact on clinical care. Then I'll go on to talk a bit about, as I said, the epidemiology and outcomes following AKI. And then a bit about risk prediction and the risk prediction models that are out there for AKI and how these can be implemented in practice. And then I'll talk about the entity of acute kidney disease, which is something that's becoming more and more talked about over the last couple of years and what the epidemiology of this is and, and what are the patient outcomes who do have um, AKD. And then I'll end a bit about recovery of AKI and some of the work looking at um, outcomes following recovery. <clears throat> So when you look back to the definitions, it was a long time ago now that the definition for CKD, it doesn't feel like it, but it was uh, in 2002 um, when it was introduced by Kay Doke and then adopted in 2004 by Kay Daigo. And over 10 years um, for the Kay Daigo AKI um, definition where the Aiken definition was refined and adopted by, by Kay Daigo. When you look at that guideline, they did actually mention acute kidney disease in that, um, but there was no definition given at that time, and they considered that AKI was a subset of AKD. And then um, in 2017, the Acute Dialysis Quality Initiative um, proposed a definition for acute kidney disease, um, and then they, they felt that AKI um, preceded most AKD. And then 2020, Kay Daigo convened a conference where they aimed to harmonise all of these definitions. So um, this is, was the, the, the um, current um, thinking of the definitions for AKI, AKD and CKD. So you can see that, as you know, AKI is within seven days and we're familiar with the creatinine and urine based criteria and how the creatinine based criteria is then um, used in big data research. So with our staging of one, two and three um, relative to um, the baseline creatinine. Then really AKD has been introduced to bridge the gap between AKI and CKD, so that's between seven and 90 days. And the definition proposed for AKD is um, similar to AKI with the severity staging um, based on the AKI definition of one, two, three, um, with a relative uh, rise in baseline creatinine from 1.5 for one, two for two times the baseline creatinine and three or dialysis for um, stage three AKD. So the KDIGO um, conference in uh, 2020 aimed to address the need um, to harmonise these existing definitions. And what they felt was that um, there was AKI and then AKD with outcomes of recovery, early recovery, late recovery, death, and that um, AKI could precede AKD, but AKD could occur in isolation without AKI, which is interesting. And they um, proposed the definitions, as I've just mentioned to you uh, in the previous slide of AKI, AKD, CKD, as shown in the table here. So a few years ago, um, we wanted to see what was going on in terms of application of these definitions. And there was a feeling that um, there was a lot of epidemiological work going on out there and that people um, 
interpreted the KDIGO definition in different ways. And the worry with that would be that then um, the results weren't really comparable um, with differences in findings. So we carried out a scoping review and at that time um, we looked at 174 studies and the major big part of these were looking in the post-operative period at um, almost 38% and 30% in the ICU setting. Most of these studies did include exclude dialysis patients of so 80% excluding them and uh, more than a third excluded transplant patients. When looking at the uh, definition of AKI that was given, so all these studies had to have um, stated that they adopted the KDIGO AKI definition. 15% gave no clear definition for how they defined AKI at all. And there was a lot of heterogeneity in how baseline creatinine was defined, with 20% of studies not explicitly um, describing how they um, calculated baseline creatinine. And recovery was um, definition um, was only mentioned in 19.5% of studies. So well, I think on the back of our scoping review, we could conclude that there really was a lack of consistency in the application of this definition um, when an analysing routinely collected healthcare data sets and also a lack of transparency in reporting of the definition used. So we then decided that we would try and do a Delphi to try and come to some kind of consensus and we didn't realise how difficult this would be um, when we embarked on it. And so um, we uh, sent out an online um, survey of a couple of rounds to nephrologists and epidemiologists, people who are interested in data across the world. The majority of respondents were the UK, USA. And Canada and we had about 35 in our first round and I think it was quite an onerous online survey I don't know if anyone listening did it but it was quite long and um, laborious and so I think the in round two it did drop off a little bit but um, there was a vast variation in opinions and we didn't actually appreciate how people's opinions were so differing on this topic. There was a some consensus and aspects of baseline and most people agreed that dialysis patients should be excluded from these studies, but there was huge lack of um, consensus on other aspects, particularly renal recovery. And um, there was a lot of strong feeling about uh, from people who disagreed with the KDIGO definition itself. So on the back of that, we made a few recommendations. So I think some of these studies included the 0.3 milligram per deciliter rise over 48 hours and some didn't and some didn't even explicitly say whether they did. But we said that they should state that um, and also their time frame. There should be a clear definition of baseline renal function because as I'll show you later, um, it does matter um, when examining AKI and um, excluded patient groups should be specified and that it would be helpful if moving forward KDIGO actually included a definition for AKI when applying to epidemiological routinely collected data so we can um, have more consistent um, uh, findings that can be comparable uh, globally. So moving on to global AKI incidence, and this is just um, taken from a, a meta-analysis um, of AKI incidence um, across the world. And so you can see that uh, across high income countries, it's fairly consistent uh, around 22.3% in North America with um, Western Europe at 20.8% and Northern Euro Europe at 19.3%. And the characteristics of AKI in high income countries are very different to those in low or middle income countries. And in high income countries, it's, it's uh, a condition that occurs in hospitalised patients who are in ICU, that are elderly with comorbidities. It's difficult to prevent. Um, reporting in high income countries is, is, is good, but this is a problem in low to middle income countries and it's very costly to treat in terms of um, renal replacement therapy. So uh, characteristics, as I said, of AKI in high income countries are hospitalised patients who are older, who have underlying CKD, have heart failure, who are diabetic, who are often in the ICU, who are undergoing surgery on uh, uh, specific medicines often, septic or um, exposed to contrast. <laughs> 
The Piper Ops of AKI is also, um, as I said, an important cause of AKI in um, high income countries. And this is um, due to specific factors that can occur in the perioperative period, such as renal hypoperfusion, um, but also operation specific factors such as emergency surgery, cardiac surgery. Cardiac surgery, cardiac surgery, cardiac surgery. Um, and, in, and in cardiac surgery, the use of an intraaortic balloon pump or cardiopulmonary bypass um, can be associated with AKI, as can intraperitoneal surgery. Moving on to um, AKI epidemiology again, so it's one in five hospitalised patients. Patients in the ICU, it's as high as one in three to two in three. One in five patients undergoing cardiac surgery and one in 20 to one in two people with sepsis, obviously dependent on the degree severity of AKI. When looking at AKI rates, um, there was work done by Simon Sawney in Aberdeen, who is interested in applying a um, uniform definition of AKI to three um, UK population-based cohorts um, over uh, different time periods. And so this was in England, Scotland and Wales. As I said, he um, harm, um, proposed a harmonised KDIGO AKI definition and then provided code to these different centres um, so we could establish in the same way rates of AKI. And actually, after standardisation for age and sex, AKI rates were similar, uh, 142 to 151 per 10,000 per year. When looking by age, it's remarkable that in less than 40, but not surprising, it's around 20 per 10,000 per year, but in the over 70s, 550 per 10,000 per year. More recently, in fact, very recently, um, this Simon Sonny and Matt James have um, published this um, in Kidney International. And what he, he they did was they um, again um, provided um, the same homogeneous analytical approach um, of definition for AKI and AKD. And there were four populations, po based cohorts in this. So in the UK, it was Grampian, which is where Simon is, and Tayside, where I am, and then Denmark, and then Canada, where Matt James is. And this was over uh, a period of time from 2011 to 2014. So this included 7 million adults um, with a median of age of um, between 59 and 68. And what they again found was that AKI and AKD rates were, were similar across these four different high income populations at 134 to 162 events per 10,000 patient years after age and sex standardisation. When you look at one year mortality by the criteria used to um, define baseline creatinine, you can see it's fairly consistent um, unless you use a baseline that goes out beyond 90 days, um, where you can see in that dotted grey line that it, it, it underestimates the mortality. This study looking at AKI in hospitalised patients was from 103 NHS hospital trusts in England. And again, this was a, a large linked biochemical administrative and mortality data study um, over the time period of 2017 and 2018. During that time, there were 250,504 AKI episodes and they find a huge 30 day mortality of 28.6%. And what was um, interesting was that there was significant variation across the centres in these um, rates of mortality. But patients who had an AKI were five to 10 times higher mortality rates than those without. Mortality was lower where there were specialist nephrology services on site and um, it was depressing to see that deprivation was associated with a higher risk of death and undoubtedly this will have been um, aggravated by the, the pandemic if this was to, to be done again um, during the pandemic times. So why is AKI um, important and I think there's increasing evidence base um, showing all the adverse um, consequences of the AKI such as increased mortality, future risk of developing CKD, Patients with AKI will stay an average of 4.7 days longer in hospital and there's significant financial um, burden to healthcare services. In terms of outcomes, there's a systematic review looking at studies that defined AKI 
um, using consensus SOCADIGO criteria with a presence of a non-AKI comparative group in at least one year follow-up. And this study, um, systematic review, showed that in pooled analysis, there was a 1.8 increased hazard of death in patients who'd had an AKI compared to those who hadn't. Also with CKD, um, future CKD, there is a 2.67 um, hazard increased risk of CKD in those who'd had an AKI compared to those who hadn't, and a 4.81 increased hazard of um, uh, end-stage renal disease. As you would expect, as the severity of AKI increased, so did um, the risk, um, uh, which is in keeping with um, all of the literature out there. In terms of mortality, again, this is another Scottish um, study, uh, again from Grampian. So they looked at 17,630 patients hospitalised between 2003 to 2013, um, looking at intermediate outcomes, which were defined as 30 to 364 days, and long-term outcomes, which was one to 10 years. They found that um, as um, the time went on, mortality fell with the highest risk being in the intermediate, so the early period following the AKI. And this was across all levels of baseline GFR. So as you can see on the right, so at the top, so over 60 GFR, 45 to 59 in the middle and 30 to 44 at the bottom. So it just really shows that the prognostic um, importance of a discrete AKI episode lessens over time. So another interesting um, study which um, was carried out by Matt James again and um, was looking at factors associated with CKD um, post AKI and th their aim was to develop a risk score to identify those at high risk of CKD after discharge. So they wanted to predict a GFR of less than 30 mils per minute for at least three months in the year post discharge and this was developed in 9,973 patients and validated in a further 276, 2,761. Performance of the prediction model was excellent with a statistic of 0.87 in their development cohort and 0.81 in their validation cohort. And the factors that they found, and, and it won't be surprising as clinicians were older age, female sex, higher baseline creatinine, albuminuria, severity of AKI and higher creatinine at discharge. But I think this is definitely would be a useful tool to kind of um, stratify which patients you wanted to make sure were followed up um, in the clinic. So moving on to um, AKI risk prediction. So when you look at the literature, um, there are a number of well-established risk factors for AKI. So older age, gender, the presence of underlying CKD, heart failure, diabetes, liver disease, surgery, sepsis, certain medicines, hypotension, hypovolemia, certain laboratory parameters such as haemoglobin, anemia, albuminuria. And so with all of these risk factors, it's, it's a wealth of data for the development of risk prediction tools. And when you look at the literature, um, there are a number of risk prediction tools out there, multiple settings, but at the moment, I don't think there are um, risk prediction tools that are in widespread use. Um, methods for developing these have been the uh, traditional logistic regression or more recently machine learning. But the problems are the sample sizes are small in some of them. There's problems with missing data. A lot of risk prediction um, studies have no external validation. And again, there was this problem of substandard reporting of methodology. Tripod, which is a checklist such as strobe, has been developed to try and remedy this, and this has certainly helped in the reporting of risk prediction models. So this is the transparent reporting of a multivariable prediction model for individual prognosis or diagnosis. So um, I just want to talk a little bit about a risk prediction model that we developed in Tayside, Scotland, where we wanted to predict um, AKI after orthopaedic surgery. So um, we developed this in 6,220 patients in one hospital in Tayside and then validated it in another hospital with 4,395 patients. Um, and we had a reasonable uh, performance of the model with a C-statistic of 0.74 falling to 0.7 in the validation um, cohort. 
So the factors that we found associated uh, um, with post-operative AKI were diabetes, gender, age, if the patient was on an ACE inhibitor and ARB prior to surgery, the number of medicines they were on as a proxy for comorbidity and the ASA grade, which is a American Society of Anesthesiologists grade, which kind of gives you an idea of underlying um, status of the patient functionally and, and medically. And baseline renal function. When we looked at survival as well, the majority of these patients were mild stage one AKI, AKI that was transient. We found that um, survival was significantly worse for those who'd had an AKI, and this was even on um, a adjusted COX model. So we have um, tried to Im implement this prediction model um, to be used preoperatively to try and identify patients who are at high risk. Um, and really, in terms of intervention, I think the interventions are just basically good care, which they should be getting anyway, but um, uh, a, a greater adherence, uh, monitoring of fluid balance, ensuring that they remain hydrated, avoiding hypotension, avoiding non-steroidals and these kind of simple measures. So um, uh, we had developed this into an app. A further non-cardiac surgery risk score um, is the SPARCS risk score, which is a South Korean one, which um, was all non-cardiac surgery. Um, and it, they predicted critical AKI in huge numbers of patients, 51,000 patients, and validated in 39,764 patients with good predictive performance of 0.8 um, C-statistic in the discovery and 0.72 in the validation cohort. Again, their prediction um, Preoperative factors were similar to ours with the addition of a few more, so gender, duration of surgery, baseline renal function, un underlying CKD, whether it was emergency sur surgery, diabetes, age, if they were an ACE or ARB prior to surgery, albumin, haemoglobin and sodium, albuminuria. So a few more, but similar kinds of risk factors. Um, moving on to community AKI, and I just want to talk a little bit about a study that we did where we wanted to develop a risk score for community AKI. So again, we did this in our Tayside um, cohort, which is population based um, level data. So 273,450 patients and we linked all the um, healthcare data sets. Um, and we then wanted to validate this in two external cohorts. So we worked with Matt James to validate an Alberta data. So that was over a million patients and an English data set in Kent with Chris Farmer. And um, we found what we really wanted to do was develop a parsimonious, simple model that could be implemented into care um, that we could easily identify patients at high risk of AKI. And we um, got it down to four factors. So baseline, uh, renal function, diabetes, heart failure and age. And we're currently in the process of working with um, colleagues in NHS England to try and implement this in primary care health systems with associated flags for GPs to um, try and um, flag up high risk patients. So moving on to um, machine learning and we can't really talk about risk prediction models without uh, talking about this uh, study that was carried out by Google um, on the US Veterans Affairs database where they looked at enormous numbers of patients, 703,782 individuals, over 6 billion clinical event entries, 620,000 variables with a recurrent neural network machine learning algorithm which was time updated. And what this model did was provided updates of estimates um, of future AKI risk throughout admission. They um, suggested a cut point that would capture 55.8% of AKI cases within 40 hour window. However, there was two false predictions for every true positive, um, which would be appropriate for a low cost, high yield intervention. But the predictive performance was absolutely excellent. So you can see that this, this is a great um, prediction model, but it's an extremely complex algorithm which requires significant computing power, um, which 
was allowed for by the Google resources, but not practical for implementation in, in healthcare systems uh, around the world. So moving on to renal recovery. So um, there is increasing work looking at renal recovery, but it's it's less studied than AKI um, epidemiology. Um, and I think partly because there really isn't a, a definition out there that's been adopted for how you should define recovery. So we've got AKI with early recovery um, in the first seven days post-operatively, and then seven to 90 days, you've got AKD and late recovery, um, and then CKD. This is one of the early studies looking at the recovery trajectories by John Kelvin colleagues at the University of Pittsburgh, looking at almost 17,000 patients from eight ICUs and looking at the stage two and three AKIs over a period of eight years um, from 2000 to 2008. They suggested these different um, recovery trajectories. So early sustained reversal within seven days, late reversal after seven days, early reversal with one or more relapses, but ultimate recovery, and early reversal with one or more relapses but, and no recovery, and then finally no reversal at all. And when you look at the survival, according to the different types of recovery trajectories, you can see that early sustained reversal is associated with the best uh, survival um, with no reversal at all, as you would expect with the, the worst survival. And you can see a range of uh, different trajectories and survival in, in the graph here. Further study um, of two ICU cohorts um, defined resolving AK as a decrease in serum creatinine of more than 0.3 milligrams per deciliter or more than 25% from max in the first 72 hours and non-resolving AKI not meeting this above definition. They find that non-resolving AKI was associated with a high risk of death and patients who had a resolving AKI experienced fewer hospital and ICU days, which again is, is, is what you would expect. In terms of long term outcomes, um, there was uh, the prospect of multi centre cohort assessed AKI study um, where the uh, patients with and without AKI who survived hospitalisation for three months were enrolled and followed up for a median of 4.7 years. It was a similar definition to the study that um, uh, I mentioned previously. And what they found was that resolving AKI um, was had a 1.5 fold um, increased uh, risk of um, uh, the composite endpoint of um, uh, CKD, um, mortality and end stage renal disease, so make and non resolving AKI was at 2.3 fold it has increased hazard um, of make. And you can see that in the graphs here. So we've got risk of make at the top, risk of CKD and risk of CKD pro uh, progression. Um, a further study carried out from Australia was looking at the incidence of AKD in hospitalised patients um, and its association with MAKE, CKD, kidney failure and death. So this was almost 63,000 patients between 2012 and 2016. Um, so there was 3,921 with AKI alone, but a combination of AKD with AKI, but AKD without AKI as well. When looking at um, rates per uh, 100 patient years of make CKD, end stage renal disease and mortality, you can see that um, uh, significantly increased in patients with AKI with AKD, but also with AKD without AKD, AKI, so you could, but less marked um, in the patients who did have AKI preceding their AKD. Oops. Further population based cohort from Alberta with a median follow up of six years and um, again looked at 15 uh, uh, looked over a million patients found 15,777 patients which was 1.4% of the population had AKI and 42,487 
thousand, which was 3.8% of the population had AKD without AKI, which was um, interesting and, and not what you would expect to see. They found that patients who had an AKI were associated with an increased hazard of death at 3.23, but the ones that did have an AKD with no preceding AKI were also associated with increased hazard of death, but less marked, so at 1.42. They found that both patients with AKI and patients with AKD with no preceding AKI were associated with uh, the risk of developing CKD, end-stage renal failure and um, albuminuria. In terms of AKI recovery and hospitalisation, hospitalised patients, this is a recent study from the University of Florida looking at um, over 156,000 patients between 2012 and 2019. They defined persistent AKI as an AKI episode lasting beyond 48 hours and rapid reversal as complete reversal of AKI by the KDIGO criteria within 48 hours of AKI incident onset. They found that patients who had no renal recovery were associated with a four to five fold increased risk of death independent of AKI severity. And you can see that here in this um, uh, graph. So at the bottom, you've got persistent AKI without renal recovery with the worst uh, survival. And then you've got uh, in the yellow persistent AKI with renal recovery and blue rapidly reversed AKI and the green no AKI at all. Just want to mention a study that we are just working on at the moment, which is currently un unpublished, um, that we're looking at recovery from AKI in Scotland. So this is again another data linked population based cohort. So 56,906 patients with AKI over a period of from 2010 to 2018 in Tayside and Fife regions of Scotland. Um, and when you look at the Sankey diagram, you can see the majority of these patients were stage one um, AKI, so over 45,000. Of these, 35% um, recovered, 33% um, didn't recover, so then went on to, to be AKD, of which 41% recovered. What was interesting and, and quite marked was the fact that 23% of those who had an AKI1 were not tested again. So difficult to know what happened to these patients. These peace spline um, charts show the impact of recovery and um, timing on one year all cause mortality in community acquired, hospital managed and hospital acquired AKI. So you can see that the um, earlier the recovery, the, um, the, uh, the, the better the outcomes. And similarly with the development of uh, uh, de novo CKD. So when looking at one year mortality of AKD compared to early recovery, um, the one year mortality, um, there was a, a 1.2 fold increased hazard of death um, in those who had AKD compared to those who recovered early and a 2.21 fold increased hazard of um, de novo CKD. Um, it's difficult to extrapolate much from the community acquired, community managed group because that was a group that had a huge number of patients that were untested. In terms of factors in our cohort that were associated with the delayed recovery AKD, the community managed AKI, so the odds ratio of 2.34, chronic heart failure, odds ratio 1.14, cancer, 1.22 and uh, what appears to be a protective effect of being on an ACE inhibitor of an ARB. In terms of other studies looking at time to AKI recovery and future loss of kidney function as a US veterans um, uh, database again um, with KDIGO stage two and three and um, between 2002 and 2014 and they looked at time to recovery um, according to one to four days, five to ten days, eleven to thirty days and thirty one to ninety days and um, the early recovery um, the the uh, as the um, the longer um, the time to recovery, the worse outcomes. And they looked at um, outcomes of sustained 40% decline in GFR or end stage renal failure. Um, recovery from dialysis this is a huge study from USRDS um, looking at over a million patients with 
uh, dialysis patients, of which 32,598 had instant dialysis due to AKI. And in um, the patients, they compared the patients who had kidney failure due to AKI to uh, patients who had kidney failure due to diabetes, and they found that there was an increased risk of death, um, particularly in the first three months um, in those patients. And they found that 35% um, uh, recovered and 95% of these recovered within 12 months and the lowest uh, likelihood of recovery were in females and Blacks, Asians, Hispanics and Native Amer Americans. So in terms of risk factors for known recovery, these are fairly um, similar to risk factors for AKI itself. So underlying CKD, hypertension, diabetes, cardiac disease, age and severity of AKI. So that's me um, coming to an end. Um, so in conclusion, there is a vast amount of epidemiological um, data out there examining AKI since the definition. Um, and this data has uh, a lot of um, important utility for looking at outcomes, for developing risk prediction models and, and hopefully influencing the care of these patients. But uh, and also this entity of AKD, there's more and more data on this and looking at outcomes uh, following AKD. But there is a significant variation in application of these definitions and the lack of consensus of many issues and also lack of transparency in reporting. And I think these things really need to be um, made uniform as we move forward to try and um, produce more robust, consistent data um, across multiple centres. Um, there's no agreed definition for recovery following AKI, but I think um, there have been various trajectories that have shown, identified, that show outcomes of um, following uh, AK, following renal recovery, and that early recovery is, is associated with better outcomes. Risk factors for non-recovery are similar to risk factors for AKI, and defining recovery trajectory could hopefully help with risk stratification and future management of patients. Thanks very much for your time and I'm happy to take any questions. Thanks, uh, Thanks uh, Samira, for Samira, that Samira. wonderful uh, overview. And uh, it's kind of, uh, you gave us a bird's eye view of the whole spectrum of AKI. Um, uh, and if anyone has any questions, please uh, raise your hand or you can unmute yourself and ask questions. But before, you know, I can start the ball rolling. Uh, one of the questions I've always had is how come you have uh, how come you have such a great registry and how was it set up? Was it like, was it always there or, or is it something that happened in the last few years? So, so this, um, the, the, the work that we're doing is our population-based data from Tayside and then similarly, um, Grampian have um, good population-based data. But in terms of our registry at the moment, our, our Scottish Renal Registry, we have started collecting AKI requiring dialysis but we haven't, it's very difficult to collect AKI across a whole country um, uh, and, and that data is very messy. I think the UK Renal Registry are trying to do it with the um, electronic alerts, but I think the data is patchy and it's not complete. So yeah, we're, we're, our, our, yeah our registry isn't, is nowhere near there at the moment, unfortunately. Yeah. Yeah, and, and I know Ted Clark, who, who couldn't be here today, he's probably teaching uh, or on service. He's, we are trying to do something similar with our, we have a similar administrative database and, and we are doing that, but uh, it, it's quite messy um, as well. Um, the, um, the other question I had is about um, the whole uh, competing stuff uh, and the confounding, right? The ACE inhibitor ARB that you showed in, in, one, in, the, in, in one study, it seemed to be worse, in another, it seemed to be perhaps protective. Uh, and, and there was that study from Nish Panu a few years ago showing that, you know, if you continue ACE inhibitors, you do better perhaps. Uh, and you always wonder about selection bias, right? Who gets the ACE inhibitor, who doesn't? Um, is that something you can tease out or do you have any insight into how we should be thinking about it? I think I think that's a very difficult question. I think most of the evidence coming out there showing that um, uh, continuing ACE inhibitors are better, but obviously in an AKI, I don't think anyone would continue an ACE inhibitor. You just, you just wouldn't, you know? Um, but it's all observational data. You don't know the patients are taking it at the time of developing the AKI. You don't know if they've continued it. It's you're just going on what's been prescribed, and I think probably it's it's um, a marker 
of underlying health conditions and their their general status, I, I would think. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and with the AKD uh, stuff that you showed again, I, I've read the uh, the uh, opinion papers and the KD go definitions, but uh, and of course the work you have done and Matt has Matt James has uh, published, but we haven't really actioned anything about that, right? I don't talk about AKD when I see a patient. It's not a term that has somehow translated into into clinical practice uh, or or anything of that sort. It, the epidemiological data is very convincing. Uh, again, it took a long time for us to even apply the AKI definitions, uh, yes. and maybe culture change is hard, and we have to wait for you know our fellows to grow up, and maybe they will start using it. But is there anything else like how do we how do we move forward and and start using it? Uh, so I think I think the problem is with AKD is that they're not in hospital by then, so they're out in the community, and it's sort of. <laughs> For us, um, maybe out of sight, out of mind, and I, I mean that they they did come up with a number of um, uh, recommendations on how these patients should be followed up uh, in the, in the nephrology services and in these um, kind of consensus statements that have come out. But um, again, it's it's impossible to keep a track of all these patients in practical terms, just to have the resources to follow these patients up repeatedly, and and then really. Uh, what would you do? Is there any evidence to suggest it would make any difference? Do you know, so it is interesting and it's an interesting epidemiological, but I think time will tell how it will translate into actual nephrology practice. Yeah, yeah. And on that note, uh, you know, just like for AKI, uh, you know, you have all those risk prediction scores where we say you should do what you should be doing anyways, you know, provide them good quality care. Um, the same thing for these patients, right? Uh, so um, uh, locally uh, in, in Canada, Sam Silver at uh, Kingston, he's talked about having this, uh, and Ron Wall, they have talked about having this clinic for patients who have AKI and and who have sort of maybe recovered, not recovered completely. Um, and again, I think that maybe you should have a trial, uh, an RCT or something. Uh, but the premise again is that you just provide them, you know, the good quality care, better blood pressure control, make sure they're on, you know, guideline therapies for CKD. Uh, is that something you are looking at? Like, uh, is there any post AKI care um, uh, that, uh, you know, for recovered, partially recovered patients that you provide or you could think of doing? Um, we're not currently doing it. And I think obviously things have got much more difficult since the pandemic and seeing patients. I think people are doing um, post-AKI follow-up. And I know that certainly in the big centres down in London, they have post-AKI follow-up clinics and AKI nurses and things like that um, who, who do uh, follow up these patients. But yeah, I, I find it difficult as well. So you have a young patient maybe who has postpartum AKI and requires dialysis and then recovers and discharge. How long do you see that patient for? You feel like you should see them, but you know it's and and you know it's, it's probably primary care could be monitoring the renal function and blood pressure in the long term going forward. It's difficult. I don't know if you do anything difficult different. Yeah, yeah, and, and primary care should be doing you know the, all the logical things that uh, you know what is special about us uh, doing that. Um, Dr. Garpinski. Yeah, there's a question in the chat as well, but I'll uh, since I brought it, uh, since I I'll ask my question first. I, I it strikes me that what we're talking about is kind of dancing around how do you use this data? Is it useful at the individual patient level? Is it useful at kind of that clinic of patients level? Can we make some of them better? And, and then I wonder if you've thought about like, is do we use it at the system level? Do we actually just identify that if we're going to do this many cardiac surgeries, we need this many nephrologists and this many dialysis units? So do you have a sense of like what the best use of this data might be and 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 where the next studies should look at kind of how we use this for to to improve health like whether it's at a population level or a single level i think that's, a, that's an excellent point and, and and a great question but yeah i'm uh, quite difficult for me to answer and i agree there are multiple levels that this data can be applied at and probably would make sense to do it more at a population kind of systems based level but yeah, I, I, I am moving forward at, at the moment. I suppose the work that we're doing with implementing the the primary care risk prediction is at a whole country level in NHS England. 
but then I, I, we'll need to see how that work pans out because it's the, I, I don't know how you find it with the electronic alerts. There's a lot of this kind of fatigue with these yeah. kind of things and you don't want people to just completely switch off to it all, you yeah. know, by, by saying you need to do this, you need to look out for this. I, I don't know. How, how do you find it there? Is it the same with the, do you have the electronic alerts still going? We have some, we get some risk prediction models around our uh, transplant choices, our EMR currently flags a patient uh, risk of death. But again, translating that to what you do for that individual person, I think is very, very challenging. Um, so I always wonder, you know, how we bridge the gap between these large epidemiologic studies to, you know, what we actually end up doing. I think that's a real challenge. But I think Dr. Uh, Jan Dyer's question is actually get back to that individual and and seeing if you have any suggestions. Yeah, so so uh, Pankaj is asking in the chat about uh, any insight on what's the ideal time to restart, uh, you know, ACE, ARB or Flozins after AKI. Uh, and, I, and I would say, you know, should you even uh, hold it like we discussed before? Uh, uh, but if you have held it, uh, what's the right time to start? Yes, I mean, so I mean, obviously, if it's a severe AKI, I, I, I would wait till they're back to baseline and then and then restart it. But I, I would make sure that the, the worry is that they get discharged off it and then they don't get it back. Very timely way, you know, when they go back to the GP. So. That's, I think, quite important to make sure it started. Um, I don't know, with these mild AKIs, probably shouldn't be stopping them, do you know, in the community, these little fluctuations and creatinines. Um, but certainly, as you, we said before, with a severe AKI, you can't really sit and, and continue <laughs> with these drugs when when patients have like an AKI two or three. Well, how, what, what would you suggest? What? How do you, when would you start it? <laughs> I don't know if Pankaj wants to uh, unmute yourself uh, and, and uh, reply to that. Uh, the, you know, again, trials would be so useful in this area, right? Uh, and, and the knee-jerk reaction is whenever there's a blip in the creatinine is to stop these drugs, mm -hmm. unfortunately. Uh, so that's something we have been fighting for. Uh, I, I hope more and more successfully with this. Uh, uh, Steve Coca had this permissive hypercreatinemia concept where, you know, if the patient is doing well, and uh, especially in the setting of heart failure, if the creatinine yep. goes up, then maybe you should uh, you should continue uh, uh, these drugs. You know whether it's diuretics as well, uh, but ACRBs, uh, you know MR antagonists, flozins. Uh, let's be brave and continue uh, uh, through. But you're you're absolutely right, right? That's one of the purposes of that post AKI clinic that people have talked about is to make sure these these drugs, which are often stopped, uh, get restarted uh, uh, so that they get appropriate care. To either prevent uh, CKD later on or or uh, help in uh, slowing down the progression uh, of AKI. Um, uh, yeah, yeah. So like, uh, just I noticed like if patient has AKI and uh, dialysis dependent and say he recover with a residual EGFR of 30, 35, then uh, there is a lot of hesitation to restart again, you know, ACRB and the fear the EGFR will drop again and he will again land up on the dialysis. So uh, it's really, you know, like if mild AKI, definitely, like if EGFR is 50, 60, definitely. But if the dialysis dependent and then recover and EGFR below. So what's your thought? Like what do you do generally in, in this case? Yeah, I mean, I, I suppose I, I would try and restart um, these drugs in these patients. I, I suppose it goes back to the other question of how long do you watch the GFR go down before you stop them, you know, in the low clearance setting? Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I, I mean, and but obviously if you're getting to be low 20, it's difficult, I suppose. I, I, and I suppose the indications for why they're on these drugs is important as well. And mm -hmm. uh, that would that would alter your threshold of restarting them, I think. And I think oh. one of the things with the flozins is that they're probably they're not encouraging people to check the creatinine very soon after starting them for the fear of people just stopping them again. Mm -hmm. yeah, I agree. Thank you. Don't check the creatinine. That way you will not stop it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's true. Um, so if there are no other questions, I think we'll we'll uh, 